side. And if you haven't made the connection, uh, John and Terry are brothers. And so we are excited about having uh, more of the McFadden family with us. And Terry, if I were to ask you, do you know that Jesus Christ lives in your heart? Yes, I do. Amen. And as we were saying this morning, which means that your salvation is complete in Christ. And so he's coming today to give a picture of what Christ has done in his life and to be obedient to the Lord's command. Terry, based upon your profession of faith, it is our privilege as a church family to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. God bless you. And this great young man is William, and William went with our uh, group to Falls Creek. And William, do you know that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, Lord? Yes, sir. Amen. And he's wearing this shirt that we baptize in. It says, I'm not ashamed, and I'm so grateful that you're not ashamed of Christ today to come forward publicly and follow him in believer's baptism. Based upon your profession of faith, it is our privilege as a church family to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Amen. And, uh,
Savior this morning. Bless the Lord.
blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, and oh, what a foretaste of glory of God and born of His Spirit and washed in His blood. Do you have that perfect blessed assurance? Perfect submission All is at rest And I in my sin story is no longer a story of death, but
but a story of life because of your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the opportunity to praise your name, Lord. We praise your name through our obedience, Lord, through the lifting up of our voices, God, and through our offertory, God, as we give our time, our money, Lord, and our gifts to you, God, as an act of worship. And so we just thank you so much for giving us grace, mercy, and love, Lord, this morning. God, you are deserving of every breath that we utter, that we breathe, God, should be returned back to you, Lord, to praise you and your glorious name, God. So we come before you this morning, in Jesus' name, amen.
be praying for Vacation Bible School. Every year we usually ask, how many of you were introduced to the Lord, came to the Lord during Vacation Bible School? And we find that several came. It's a life-changing time for our students. I believe that there are some, it's like Elijah, or excuse me, it's like Samuel, that Samuel uh, heard the voice of God calling, wasn't sure what that meant, uh, went to Eli and said, hey, and he goes, no, 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 go back. And I believe that God works. For some, He draws them to that point of salvation. And to others, He um, brings them to more of a sensitivity in their spirit. And that when the Holy Spirit really awakens them to that time. So, not just a busy week, but a great week here. As we have the privilege of uh, our children, children from the community, coming in. And be able to share with them about the saving message uh, of Jesus Christ. And so it will be uh, a great, great time. I ask you to pray that the Spirit would move in His Word into our hearts. And that it would find uh, a place to bed there in our hearts. So let's pray. God, we're always excited to open up Your Word. We believe it. We stand on it. We declare it, we preach it, as it is simply that, your word. And so, Father, may that word become alive in our spirits today, in our hearts. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. There's something about the human nature that we find that is on a search. It feels like there's something missing. There feels like there's something that we've got to seek out, something more out there in the world. Let me show you what I mean. What would cause a man in the flesh to marry a beautiful woman outside and inside as well, physically and spiritually, but then he begins to think in his mind, there's got to be more to this marriage than what I have. There's got to be something else that I'm missing out, so what does he do? He, he divorces her. She's okay, but in that spirit, he said, man, there's got to be more. Marriage has got to be more fulfilling than my marriage is to her. And so he divorces her, and he goes on this search, and he finds another, and then another, and then another. Because in his heart, in his spirit, he feels like there's something else out there. What causes a man in his 50s to quit his job to buy a motorcycle, I've thought about that a time or two, but Deanne has threatened my life, and uh, just to leave everything behind. And he goes on this search, this pilgrimage, and saying, you know what, I, I, I think I, there's something else out there for me. There's a, something that I'm missing in life, and I'm going on this search. And he heads out. There's something inside of us, whether it's our family or whether it's our career or whether it's even in our spiritual life that we say, you know, there's something more. There's got to be more. But I want you to hear from the Apostle Paul as he declares God's word for us today. He says, you are complete in Christ. He said, you are complete in Christ. So here's what I'm saying to you. Stop the searching. Stop that feeling that there's got to be something else out there. Rest in the fact today that you are complete in Christ. Don't allow somebody to come to you and say, hey, you're missing out. Man, there's so much more out there that you're missing out on in Christ. And don't let somebody deceive you like that because you are complete in Christ. Take your Bibles and look and study with me in Colossians chapter 2, beginning with verse 10 through verse 15. Uh, 
Colossians might be, just might be, my favorite book in the New Testament. Uh, I really love spending time there this week, and as you have as well. Notice as it begins, it says, and in Him you have been made complete. Man, we could stop there and camp out the rest of our time. You need to underline that in your Bible. That in Him, notice what it says, you are complete. Nothing lacking, nothing longing, nothing undone. In Him, you have been made complete. And He is the head over all rule and authority. And in Him, there you go again, in Him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with Him through faith in the working of God, who raised Him from the dead. And when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, and which were, notice this word, hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And when he had disarmed the rulers and the authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Paul says there's three areas that we find in this passage that you're going to see that you are complete in Christ. I want you to notice verse 10 again to emphasize it. It says, in him you were been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. Look at the word complete just for a moment. The idea is to be filled up. It's an idea that you bring a jar, a, a container to a water fountain, and you let it fill up and to overflowing. That's what the word means, to fill up. That jar is completely full. It's complete with the water. And in Christ, he is saying that you are complete in three areas. Three areas that you're going to be able to leave here today and say, you know what, I know. I know in these areas that I am complete. For some of you today, it's an end of a journey. It's an end of a search. It's the end of this feeling inside of this fleshly nature that says there's got to be more. And Christ says, I am the more. The first area that we find that you are complete in is that your salvation is complete. In the church of Colossae, there were people that were coming into the church and, and teaching in the church and, and saying to the believers that are there, man, there is something missing in your salvation. There is something that you need to add to your salvation. Your salvation is not complete. Man, you can imagine the stir and the, and the struggle that the believers are having there. What, what is it? What is it that's missing? I, I want Christ. I want to be complete in Him. I, I want to know my salvation is complete. But the same thing still happens today. And we put many tags on it. And we will say to a person that, that your salvation is not complete unless what? That you've been baptized. When you are baptized and fully immersed, then what? Your salvation is complete. Others would say, no, no, no. Your salvation is not complete until you speak in tongues. Until you have the gift of glossolalia, uh, the, the charisma, the charismatic gift, that you have never really truly been saved. You've never been complete in Christ unless that happens. Others would say, unless you have taken part in communion, the Holy Communion, until you have taken part of the Eucharist, that you have never been saved, that you've never had your salvation complete. And so Paul was dealing with those struggles, but we deal with them every day in our own lives. Of people saying that our salvation is not complete in Christ. But Paul comes back and he says, stop. Man, stop that nonsense. Stop that false teaching. Stop this journey that you're on. Your salvation is complete. Notice what he says, that Christ is head, notice in verse 10, 
over all rule and authority. And if Christ is head of all rule and authority and power, it means that he has the power to save you completely. Somebody say amen. If he truly is the head over all and all authority, my friend, he has the power to save you without your help. Amen. He can save you completely. So Paul wanted to illustrate this for us. And so he gives two illustrations. One that everybody knew, everybody was aware of, it was circumcision. Every Jewish boy at eight days old was circumcised. That brought them into the covenant family, which created an issue. For some, they believed, that meant that I was saved. The only thing that I needed to do to have a relationship with God was to be circumcised. And so you could say, I, I know that I'm circumcised, so that meant that I'm part of the covenant of God. And being a part of the covenant, God meant that I had salvation. But we find that the Scriptures never taught that. It was never true then. It's never true now. It never taught that. In Romans chapter 4, verse 11 says this, listen. Circumcision was a sign that Abraham already had faith and that God already accepted him and declared him to be righteous even before he was circumcised. So Abraham is the spiritual father of those who have faith but have not been circumcised. They are counted as righteous because of their faith. It's always been faith. Faith in God. Faith that brings us into that relationship. And we find that in Romans 2, 29, it says, the true Jew is one that has been circumcised in his heart. So look in verse 11, what he says, and in him you were also, what? Circumcised, made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. We find at the moment, that you yield your life to Christ and place your faith in Him. At that moment, there is a circumcision that happens both to male and female and to students. The circumcision is not made by human hands, human endeavor, but it is made by the Spirit of God that, that works within us. Notice the words there, the removal of the body of flesh. What, what is that referring to? It's talking about your fallen nature. That he does a work in your life to bring about salvation and remove this old sinful nature out of our lives. Notice verse 11, the key words. Circumcision made without hands. It's a spirit that is working. The spirit of God that works at our salvation and that God brings about our salvation in our lives. And Paul is using the strongest illustration to say, look, your salvation is complete. Because it had nothing to do with human effort, uh, human ingenuity. It was all of God. It was an act of God. And God brings your salvation complete. He does not need your help or anything added to what Christ has done on the cross in the empty tomb. He said, it is complete. But Paul says, you know what? Maybe I need to add another illustration. So he gives a second illustration to drive it home, and he uses baptism. And just as circumcision were a crutch for some to say, I'm saved because, hey, look, I've been circumcised. Baptism is a crutch for some to say, look, I have committed this act of going into the water, and because I've gone in the water, I'm saved. I don't know how many times that you've gone out on visitation and asked people to say, tell me your testimony. Well, man, I, I was baptized at the age of one, or I was baptized at the age of 24. Well, that's great. Man, we're excited you were baptized and made wet, but tell me, when did you come to Christ? How, how did Christ come in your life? Well, I was baptized. And there are those that still believe in this false misunderstanding that by doing an act, doing something for God, that brings about salvation. And Paul did not have that in mind here. Notice what Paul says in verse 12. Having been buried with him 
When were we buried with him? Notice it says, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Paul was talking about that spiritual union that we had with Christ. You were buried with Christ the moment that you placed your faith in him. And then when you were coming up out of the water, you've been raised symbolically of walking new and afresh with him that you've been, what, born again. I want you to notice verse 12. Interesting, the last part of verse 12. It says, just as God raised Christ, Just as God raised Christ, He raised you. He raised you to have this new birth, a new salvation in your life. And so what Paul was saying in these two illustrations is that your salvation is complete. Paid for, done, nothing lacking. If Christ was born a virgin birth, if Christ died on the cross for our sins, if Christ was raised on the third day, if Christ is the fullness of the deity in bodily form, if Christ is the head over all, it must mean that your salvation is complete, full, period, done in Christ Jesus. So my friend, some of you are still on that treadmill. Some of you are on that treadmill. I've got to do more. I've got to pray more. I've got to read my Bible more. I've got to go to church more. I've got to do more, 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 more in order for Him to accept me, in order for Him to love me. But I thought we just read that your salvation is complete. Oh, you know what? If you'll go to Brownsville, Corpus, Lincoln, Nebraska, you, you go there, hey, there is something that is happening there. If you go there, I will assure you, man, you'll find this completeness. You'll, you'll find what is missing in your life. My friend, stop the search. Try, stop trying to think that you have missed out on something. If Jesus Christ, my friend, has come into your life through the Holy Spirit and has sealed you, my friend, you can claim today that your salvation is complete in Him. And the greatest victory that could happen in your life today would be that you would accept that. The greatest victory that could happen in your life is that you would get off the treadmill and that you would say, God, I'm accepted by you Not by what I've done, what I can achieve, what I can accomplish, but because of what you have done in my life through Christ. It would do more for your spiritual life than anything that I could imagine. If you could say and believe in your heart today, my salvation, my salvation is complete in Christ and Christ alone. Somebody say amen. Second, Paul says you're complete in another area. He said your forgiveness is complete. I want you to notice this picture that Paul begins to paint for us. It's a horrible picture. Uh, It's a picture that, that really is disturbing beginning in verse 13. Notice what it says that you are dead in your transgressions. You are dead. In your transgressions, your sin nature has cut you off from God. And that spiritually, you're dead. You're a corpse. You are dead. And then second, notice what he adds to it, just to drive it home. The uncircumcision of your flesh. Your flesh is alive, your body's alive. But the spirit, that part that communicates with God, is dead. It is dead. Listen, you're born that way. You've inherited that nature. And you add to that nature through your own the propensity of sin in your life. And if you add these two together, dead in transgressions, uncircumcised in your flesh, add them together, and it's a picture where every man, every woman, every student is 
in the world today. Man, it, it is a horrible condition. It's a hopeless condition. It's a condition that will utterly condemn you to hell. That's the condition that we find ourselves in. But in that condition, God was willing to forgive you. We could shut our Bibles right here and just say, we've had enough. Really. We could shut our Bibles and say, you know what, we've had enough. I don't understand it. I don't know how I feel about it. I'm in all of it. That in that condition, when I was dead in my transgression, uncircumcised in my flesh, that Christ was willing to forgive me. And what that means is, I don't, I don't have anything to brag about. Well, look what, no, you were dead. Not too many dead people can brag about too many things, right? Well, look, I, I have a, you're dead. In that condition, cut off from God because of our sin. He was willing to forgive you. I want you to notice verse 13 and let it set into your spirit. He said, when you were dead, underline that, dead in your transgressions, uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us of all our transgressions. Some of you need to circle the word all today. Notice that Paul describes the condition in the strongest terms. He says, look, you have a certificate of debt. The word certificate literally means autograph. He says that all of us have a debt against God. And we have had to sign it. We signed it. And we have said, God, I'm a debtor unto you. And I've got this debt. What is that debt? Why do I have a debt? What does that debt look like? Look what it says. Consisting of decrees against us. The word decrees is an interesting word. It literally means dogma. Dogma. And so let's read it again. Consisting of dogma against us. What's the dogma? God's Word. So we've got this certificate of debt that I've signed at Tommy Turner. And I have sinned against God and broken His law. Lusted, stolen, prideful, greedy, committed murder in my spirit against another. And so here I am. I, I've got all these that I, I have broken the dogma. I have broken the Word of God. And I have this debt against God. But notice what it says in verse 13. And it's hostile to us. Man, it's mean. Katie and Jason were gone last week to Colorado, and they left us their dog. That's when you know your children are grown up. Amen? They don't leave you cars. They don't leave you money. They leave you a dog to take care of. This is not a dog. This is like a 400-pound dog that is sleeping in my entry hall. But Dan had this idea, said, we need to walk this dog in the morning. And I said, I can't walk the dog in the morning because we got a neighbor. Are we on TV? I better be careful. We've got a neighbor that has a Rockweiler that is in my yard, in my flower bed, and dragging this lady around. I said, if I walk the dog, Dan, it will kill Katie and Jason's dog, and they will kill you because I'll say it was your fault, you know. And, uh, and that dog was hostile. I mean, that dog is mean. It scares you to death. And you, it's our neighbor. And now they're not going to be our neighbors because we're on TV, right? And, uh, but that dog is hostile. And Paul is using this word the same way. This, since you have this debt, it wants to destroy you. This debt is hostile. It's going to eat you up. How is it going to eat you up? It's going to send you to hell. You're going to stay separated, apart from God, because you've got this list 
of indebtedness against God because you have broken God's word. Man, what are we going to do about it? But in the midst of that, notice what it says. He completely has forgiven us because he went and he nailed it to the cross. Oh. Nailed it. Nailed it to the cross. And his blood was sufficient to forgive every imaginable sin that you could ever imagine. Listen, you've been forgiven completely. Completely. But here's the key for some of you today. You need to stop living in your shame and guilt. See, that's one of Satan's greatest tools on a believer's life. He said, don't you remember what you have done? Don't you remember your act of unfaithfulness, your act of, of rudeness, your act of what you have done? And he keeps bringing those skeletons out of the closet, and he brings them out before us. Every time we, we're on this spiritual growth in our lives, he, he brings them out to, to cause us to retreat back again. And for some of you today, man, you could have victory and rejoicing in your life if you would simply say, I have been forgiven completely. It's funny. There are many of you that you believe that for somebody else. But you cannot believe it for yourself. Why is that? And so you're really at a crossroads in life today of whether you're going to accept the Word of God and say, man, I believe it. It's God's Word. Or I'm going to accept my own feelings and my own guilt and my own shame. See, every time that you limp towards 1 John 1, 9, it's only a reminder of the grace of God, the goodness of God, that He will forgive you completely. There's a third one, though, that we don't want to miss. Your victory in Christ is complete. When Christ went to the cross, and there he died. Three days later, he rose again. He, he defeated Satan. And we find that Satan was defeated. Death has been conquered and overcome. But don't you know in those six hours when he was on the cross, if we could only hear the demonic cries coming against Christ. Don't you know they laughed? They cheered. They mocked. They rebuked every filthy saying, every filthy word that could come out of a demonic being's mouth was coming out against Christ. Because in those six hours, it looked like he was defeated. The disciples were gone. They believed it. Only one was left at the cross with Mary. But we find in those hours that he was taken from the cross and put in the grave, what was occurring. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he also went, listen, and made proclamation to the spirits in prison. What is he talking about? It's those demonic spirits that are being held in prison until the day that he releases them or until the day of judgment. That we find that Christ went into that prison and said, man, I'm victorious over you, over Satan. I have won the battle. And listen to what he's saying. That we are victorious in Christ. Not that we don't have to stumble and fall, but we can live above sin. We are overcome. We don't have to live in bondage. We don't have to live in defeat and despair and discouragement in our lives. Man, that we can claim the victory in Christ. And Paul says, 
it's like a Roman general that's won a great victory and that he comes to Rome and he, he takes those that he's captive, those that he's held prisoners and the spoils, and he, he marches them down the streets of Rome and the crowd can see that the enemy has been defeated. And notice what he says in verse 15. And when he's disarmed the rulers and the authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Christ has defeated death. Christ has defeated death. And death has no power over a child of God. Paul writes, For I am convinced that neither death nor life or angels or principalities or powers or things present or heights or death, he goes on to say, is able to separate us. What? from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's some here today that need to claim this victory. Some of you are still held in bondage by death. That we need to understand that death has no control over us or our bodies. They go to sleep, but even they will be resurrected. To be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord, that we have won the victory because of Christ has won the victory. But there's some of you still living in bondage to sin. And Christ says you're an overcomer. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And you're still being shackled by it, being defeated by it. When Christ says that you can have his victory in his life. Paul says, look, you're complete. You're complete in three areas. You're complete in the area of your salvation. Some need to accept that today. Others of you need to accept his forgiveness. It's complete. It's complete. And in others of you need to claim victory in the name of Jesus today. We, my friend, are not lacking one single thing in Him. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I, I wonder what Christ would want to do in this message in your life. I, I wonder what He would want to do in your life. I wonder what He would want to do in this service today. What, what victories are waiting for us today. There's some of you that can't claim completeness in your salvation because you have never come to Christ. And today you need to come to Christ fully and completely and say, I I I'm surrendering to Christ today. But there's others of you that have already done that and you know that you've surrendered to Christ, there's no doubt in your mind, but you're living as you've got to add something to Christ. You're living as though you've got to do something more. Maybe somebody has come into your Sunday school class. Maybe somebody has come into the place that you work, handed you a pamphlet that said there's something lacking that you've got to do. Man, you got to do an, a work. You got to do a ritual. You go here, you got to go there. There's something missing, my friend. Bear your life in Christ. There's nothing missing in Him. Find freedom today in your salvation. Rejoice in it today. I've said it before, but it's been reported that the majority of the people that are in mental institutions are there because they can't get forgiveness. Man, Satan would love to keep you where you are today. Man, he would love to keep his finger in your face today and remind you what a, what a terrible person you are. Remind you of your sins. But Christ wants to remind you of the cross. He wants to remind you that it's all been paid. So listen to me as I lovingly say to you, my friend, stop it. Stop beating yourself up. Stop going back to the closet. 
Go to the cross. Go to the cross and accept His complete forgiveness over every sin, immorality, and loss, and prejudice, and pride. Name it, my friend. Man, it's covered by the blood. And there's some of you that need to claim today your victory in Christ. I'm not saying that we're not going to have struggles. I'm not saying that we're not going to have things that come against us. No. But I'm saying that we don't have to be shackled to sin. We don't have to be enslaved to anything again. Man, He has the power to set us free. We don't have to be fearful of death. Man, we are free in Christ. He has won the victory. And as Christ went down to the depths, let us hear His words. Let us claim our victory today. Friend, find it. Find it. You are complete in Christ. Father, I pray for those that need to come public today. Come publicly. Give them lives to Christ. Maybe it was at Falls Creek where they settled it. Nailed it. They need to come public today and say, you know what, I want to let it be known that I, I nailed my salvation down. But Father, all across this room, may we find ourselves filled with You. May we accept Your Word that we are complete in You. May we stop this voyage of saying another book, another writer, another television, another crusade, another event. No, it's in Christ. It's in Him. May we accept Your Word. Bring freedom to this place today. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. As we stand to our feet, you make the decisions that Christ has put on your heart today. begins in Christ alone. Let's sing it together. In Christ alone my hope is found He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love of peace when fears are still